Welcome back to Open Heart Conversations, where we come together as community to explore the world's enduring spiritual and religious traditions. I'm your host, Reverend Renee Rossi, and thank you so much for joining us today. Today we are exploring the healing power of flower essences with our guest, Lindsay Fauntleroy. Lindsay is a medicine maker, an educator, and the author of In Our Element, Soul Medicine to Unleash Your Personal Power. Her extensive training includes a Master of Arts from New York University, a Master of Science from Tri-State College of Acupuncture, and clinical training in traditional Chinese medicine, Kiko Matsumoto-style Japanese acupuncture, and myofascial trigger point release. Her approach to soul medicine emerges from over 15 years of clinical practice, her PhD studies of indigenous, of indigenous and African diasporic psychology, and her commitment to community wellness. She provides practitioner certification in the sacred art and science of flower essence therapy, and she is the founder and director of the Spirit Seed School. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I feel so honored to be here. We're grateful. We're grateful for your presence and your energy. So let's start at the beginning. Tell us what are flower essences? So flower essences are uh, holistic vibrational remedies, which are used for three reasons. They're used to bring awareness to emotions that are stuck and uncomfortable. They are used to break through our limiting beliefs. And they are used to do what I call soul evolution, which is moving through the soul hiccups, the the complexes that we find ourselves in, the ways of being that don't really serve us anymore. And it helps us to move through those things in a way that is graceful, gentle, and nature-inspired. So sounds like something that could apply to everyone, every human. (laughs) Every human, every human. There's a flower for every human. (laughs) I love that. Um, So are flower essences plant medicine? Um, or, Or can you maybe describe the difference if they are not? They are absolutely plant medicine. And the way that I think about the spectrum of plant medicine is thinking about what we're most familiar with, right? So we have our food, which is a form of plant medicine. We have our pharmaceutical medicines, which are very often, you know, chemically created to mimic the action of plants or of herbal remedies. Then we have herbal remedies and then we have flower essences. And the way that I think about it is that on a physical level, your food and your pharmaceuticals are going to do the function for you. They come into the human body and they interact with the human body in such a way that it's actually fulfilling the function that's needed. So whether that's a neurotransmitter for a psychological um, issue, whether it's hormonal, the pharmaceutical is going to do that action for you. The herbal medicine I think of as teachers. So they take a little bit longer, but they are the form of plant medicine that is teaching your body how to fulfill that particular function. And then flower essences are the form of plant medicine that bring the inspiration, the insight, and the awareness into what your life is needing in order for all of those other things to happen. Mm. So they're all plant medicine, but they exist on a spectrum and they all can work together. Amazing. So you don't have to have one or the other. It's never either or. It's yes and, and it's what is working for the patient, mm-hmm. right? What is their entry point into their healing process? Mm-hmm. And we always start there. Great. So where does this practice come from? Like when did it begin, oh. <laughs> the use of the flower essences? <laughs> it's such a, a, a loaded question. So there's two ways to think about the history of flower essence use. So on a commercial level, uh, Dr. Bach is the, the physician that is credited with flower essence therapy. So many people are familiar with Bach flower remedies. Those are the most commercially available. And so he was a bacteriologist, a physician in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that made flower essence therapy accessible to Western medicine. Mm -hmm. And I can say accessible in air quotes because he was very much ostracized for bringing this medicine forward. But when we look throughout history, when we look at indigenous medicine and indigenous practices, Plant medicine has been a part of healing and spiritual rituals for as long as humans have been on this earth. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And so I like to give the example, if you look on the, the temples, you often see pictures of plant recipes. Mm -hmm. And we can't tell if those are altar offerings, if there are recipes for foods, or if there are herbal prescriptions. But what we do know is this history of working with the plant world is ancient. And we see remnants of it in many indigenous cultures and spiritual traditions, such as the traditions that come out of the African continent, where you might make a spiritual bath using certain plants. Mm -hmm. All of that idea of working with the spiritual energy of a plant, the intelligence of a plant, and bringing that into your healing is, is a very old medicine. So I say it's both. I, I would say on a commercial level, we can attribute it to Dr. Bach, but then there is a very ancient history of this medicine in our psyche, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in our psyche and in our ancestors. So how do we acknowledge and honor that, um, okay. that history, especially somebody brand new or somebody who's maybe not even sure their, you know, ancestral connection to it? That's what I love about this medicine because you can use it as a spiritual medicine and be very connected to that lineage of working with plants. But then flower essences, because they are commercially available, you can really approach it as, as, a, as a physical medicine as well. You can really just pick up one of the Materia Medicas, look at the symptoms and say, okay, I'm you know overthinking or I can't sleep. So I'm going to use a little bit of this flower essence in the same way that we would with if we're cooking, mm -hmm. you know, when you're cooking a soup and you taste it and you're like, oh, this needs a little bit more salt or basil or whatever. In the same way, we can look at our, our psycho-emotional symptoms and say, there's too much overthinking. There's too much sadness. There's too much this or that. I'm going to add a little bit of these flower essences for that specific thing. Or it can be part of a larger honoring and acknowledgement of the relationship between humans and the natural world. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm so glad you brought the word spiritual into this because that leads me to my next question. Is the use of flower essences a spiritual practice? And if it is, like, can you give us an example of that? Yes. So one of my favorite books is a book called African Medicinal Plants. And in it, the author says, to the African worldview, living is a religious act. Mm. So from that perspective, there's very little that you can do in by way of healing, by way of healing with plants that is not spiritual. Because everything is spiritual. We are spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. And so on that level, you can use the, the flower essences for your spiritual practice and your spiritual alignment, um, for coming into deeper relationship with your intuition, or coming into a deeper sense of connection with your own purpose. Mm. So it's a spiritual medicine in that way. And then it's also, as I mentioned, a symptomatic mes uh, medicine. And so from that perspective, I tend to think of flower essences as more a psychological medicine uh, as it lives in the Western world. You know, it's a psychological medicine. And if we look back in time, we know that psychology and spirituality have only recently been separate worlds. And so, yes, and yes, it's a spiritual medicine it's also a psychological medicine. Mm -hmm. It's also an emotional medicine. And so it's really, when I'm working with a client, I'll try to get a sense of what their spiritual orientation is. Because I think that's one of the biggest, um, I, I don't want to say myths, but the deterrence is sometimes there can be a fear of working with this type of medicine and a fear that's that kind of says, oh, this is against my religion or it's against my spirituality. And it really isn't. Mm -hmm. There's space for whatever your relationship is with the source. And there's space for this healing medicine. And they can be aligned together or or not. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and I would even go so far to say that any practice that brings you more in tune and more connected to nature, which we are a part of, mm -hmm. is a spiritual practice. That's right. More in connection with nature and also more in connection with each other as a human family, mm -hmm. which is, I think, a big part of what the world is calling for right now, that heart-to-heart -heart connection, um, the ability to navigate difference. Those are some of the things that we can learn from the natural world. And, mm -hmm. and that is, to me, spiritual. That is what our spirituality helps us to be and do in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm hoping you can um, take us a little bit more in detail when we speak 
speak specifically about flower essence therapy. So you, you've talked to us what flower essences are, and now, now when we use them as therapy, what, what does that mean? So the way I distinguish it for students is that any and everyone can and should has the invitation to use flower essences symptomatically. They are meant to be a self-care medicine. When I was introduced to them, I was introduced to them by my sister-in-law, and she just had a cabinet of flower essence remedies. And she was looking at me, and I was kind of a mess in that moment, and she just pulled the remedies out. And we all have that capacity. Mm. Flower essence therapy is a process of what I would call archetypal transformation. Mm. So we are all oriented in a particular way. In this, in this philosophy. So say uh, if I move through my life as a caretaker and I'm the type of person that my default mode of relating to the world is to, to take care of things, to nurture things. And I'm stepping into an aspect of my life that is calling for me to be a warrior. That's a different archetypal organization of my, my psyche and my way of perception. And so flower essence therapy is the process of moving from one way of being in the world into a completely different mode of being in the world, moving towards the integration of different parts of ourselves. Mm. And so that process takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, it can take three months, it can take six months, it can take 10 years, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And the flower essence therapy or the person that's trained in flower essence therapy is trained to support and guide and mentor and be present for that transformational process. Mm. I love that. Um, I wonder if you could speak a bit more about these archetypes. Um, you know, are th is there a certain number of archetypes we all have within us or mm -hmm. is it always expanding? Um, tell us about those. So archetypes are one of my favorite things as it relates to this medicine and also as it relates to psychology because there are, just as there are many different cultures but different relationships with the plant world, there's different archetypal systems. And so by archetype, I'm thinking of it in the terms of a Jungian sense of the word, which uh, could be a, a pattern or an organizing system of thinking and being is the one way to think about an archetype and also that it's universal. Hmm. So it transcends time and space. So this, the archetype of mother is something that we see throughout culture, throughout time, throughout history, regardless of time, place, and location. And then there's, so there's these archetypal patterns that we would say are universal. Um, and then when we look in different indigenous psychology systems, they are also archetypal. So when we look in African diasporic traditions, we have uh, these archetypes or the Orisha, mm -hmm. um, which are not just archetypes, but they are these kind of organizing principles, these organizing patterns of thinking and acting and being in the world that relate to nature. When we look at the chakra system, uh, the yogic tradition, those are archetypal patterns. Mm -hmm. When we look at astrology, for example, those are another system of archetypal patterns. And so it's, it's really beautiful because regardless of what we believe in, in terms of which of those systems we align with or feel resonant with, we know that we go through phases of our lives mm -hmm. and we know that different aspects of ourselves are called on at different times. And so bringing Excuse me. And so bringing conscious awareness to those, that inner transformation is really what is the potential of this medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really powerful because also, you know, I'm thinking how we have archetypes, we have the roles that we play within our family systems, within our communities. Oh, and then there's the collective roles we play if, you know, maybe like I identify as a woman. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's that role as well. So it can... Um, connect us with a lot of people in a lot of different ways too. It's so true and that's such a great example. I'm the, the youngest daughter in my family system and so ingrained in me is this way of moving that is the, the little sister, the little sister archetype. Yeah. But now if I'm stepping into running a business or running a school, that little sister identity is not going to be the best persona to be wearing. And so that's an example of archetypal change. Mm -hmm. How do I step out of something that I've been doing because it's part of my, my family of origin or part of my life training to be a particular mm -hmm. way 
And now I have to learn how to step into another side of myself. Yeah. And it's beautiful because it's the philosophy is that it's all within, mm -hmm. that we have access to all of these energies within ourselves. Mm. I love that. Well, from one little sister to another. <laughs> um, can you speak about, um, which I, I believe we're already heading in this direction, about resonance? Like, why is resonance important when we're working with flower essences? So the science of flower essences is one of resonance. And so the example that I like to give is the example of music. I think music is a very palpable way to think about how flower essences work and what they're up to. And so if anyone listening is a musician, you know that if you have two guitars in the space, if they are tuned to one another, if you pluck the C string on one guitar, the C string on the other guitar will vibrate. So that's what we call sympathetic resonance. So that's the same principle at work when an opera singer hits a pitch and it shatters a glass. Mm. And so just as there's resonance in the musical world and it's this, this field of energy of vibration, we have heart-to-heart -heart resonance with one another as part of a human family. And then we also have resonance with the earth. Mm. And so with flower essences, the way that I like to think about them is imagining yourself as a symphony and imagining that all of your thoughts, all of your feelings, each with their own independent vibration, are all working together to create a beautiful music. And that's what we call health. Everything's working together. And then you lose your job or someone in your family gets sick or you have a bitter breakup. And what starts to happen is we start feeling pain. And that pain is a sign that there's something in that symphony that's out of pitch. And so the flower essences then act as a tuning fork to bring that vibration of your thoughts, of your emotions, of your feelings, of your body back into harmony with what is the right path for you in your life. Mm. I love that example. Um, to see ourselves as a symphony, it's really powerful with lots of different instruments in there. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the way flower essences work is that they raise the vibration, they raise the sound so that we can hear one particular thing more loudly than the others. Mm. So if we're working on grief, the flower essence is gonna work with harmonizing that grief, helping us to learn from that grief, helping us to bring our attention to that grief, and then also possibly releasing it so that it can move on and we can move on. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is the flower essences can connect with like the innermost parts of ourselves, with our thoughts, with our emotions, what's in our heart. Um, so I'm curious, can you speak about um, like the soul of the flower? Um, you know, these flowers have soul messages for us. Like what does that mean? And, and you can speak to that. So it's coming back to the uh, indigenous and the ancestral understanding that everything has consciousness, that everything has awareness, and that we can use the, the higher truth of a flower to help support us in our life. So I can give an example. One example is an elm tree. And so when we see an elm tree, we see this big, mighty elm tree. What we don't see is underneath the soil how that elm tree's roots are connected to other trees and how those trees are sending messages and communicating with one another. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we can learn from an elm tree is how to be supported, how to be supported in our greatness. Mm. And so that's a higher truth of nature. Right, And so when we're working with an elm flower essence, we're learning from the inside, we're learning from the resonance of how do I lean on other people for support? Mm -hmm. What gets in the way of that? What messages have I learned throughout my entire life about what it means to get support? Do I think it's a sign of weakness? All of that stuff, I call it the subconscious shenanigans, all of that stuff that's beneath the radar mm -hmm. that now comes up into the surface for us to examine. And we, we can learn that through understanding these higher truths of, of nature. Mm. It's a beautiful example. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, how, whether working with flower essences or even just in a broader sense, like how does someone begin to get into relationship with nature, with mm. plants, with the flowers, so that this is possible? Mm. I think, what comes up for me a lot, especially living in an urban environment, is remembering that nature is everywhere. Mm. So sometimes we can think about 
communing with nature and in our mind we start envisioning oh I have to go into the mountains and be in solitude in the mountains to connect with nature or I have to go on this exotic tropical vacation to be by the beach and really sometimes it's just as simple as opening your window and listening to the breeze it can be just as simple as picking up the trash on the sidewalk when you see it or it can be having a house plant so that connection with nature is, is not something that has to be out there. It's something that can be very practical and very small steps. You know, where is nature around you? That's just even the first question. Mm -hmm. And noticing, oh, there's an empty lot next to me and there's all of these wildflowers in there. You know, that's connecting with nature and mm -hmm. then allowing that to grow and expand just from your own being present. Mm. And I think that's what it comes back to is that in order to really connect with nature and to commune with nature, the first thing we really have to do is slow down and listen. And we are socialized to be moving and doing and creating and producing all of the time. Mm -hmm. And when we press pause on that, we allow space for something else to be present for us. Mm. And that's also like a really empowering message. Like it's available to all of us and you don't have to have, you know, done extensive studies or have to have been born in the certain place where you have more access to trees. Like it's, it's right. here all the time for everyone. It's here all the time. Now that's not separate from, there are some places where people are denied access to ancestral lands or denied access mm -hmm. to green spaces. And that is, I'm not bypassing that. And I'm not saying that that's not real or not problematic, mm -hmm. but I am saying that we, we can all find ways to have access. And then we can also share the responsibility in making sure that others have access yes, as yes. well. Thank you for bringing that point up. That's very important. Um, so can so let's say, you know, um, I take this advice and I start getting, you know, really in tune with the nature around me. So can I go so far as to make my own flower essences? Like, what's that process? <laughs> so yes, and <laughs> I would say the, the process of communing with nature and making a flower essence is something that it, it's not super mysterious to do. I'll just say that. So mm -hmm. There are very simple, practical ways that you can find out what plant you're drawn to and then make a flower essence. I personally would say that because we live in environments that are heavily polluted, to tread carefully with, with doing that. I, I personally, living in the city, don't cultivate my own flower essences unless I am somewhere where I can feel pretty assured that it's environmentally sound. Mm -hmm. However, there are so many ways to engage with dialogue, if you will, with the natural world. And so in one of the classes I teach, it's called Ecological Reciprocity. Mm. And we go through this process of building a relationship with a plant that stands out to us. And in that process, you're doing dream work. In that process, you're doing what's called active imagination, which comes out of the field of depth psychology. You're spending time drawing the plant. You're spending the time in quiet contemplation with the plant. Mm -hmm. All of those are powerful ways to start finding a resonance with the message of that plant without having to ingest it. So I, I would recommend even just starting there. If you start to notice, oh, I keep seeing this plant. Even on social media, every time I turn on my social media, I keep seeing this particular flower. Mm -hmm. It's recognizing that we're part of an interconnected field. Mm -hmm. So then start getting to know that flower. Mm -hmm. Start drawing it. Take pictures of it. Make digital collages of it. You know, whatever it is that brings you into that plant's environment. And then start seeing what comes up from there. Mm. I love all of these ways that you can start connecting with the plant, um, aside from ingesting it, as you said. So, um, you know, how, how would you ritualize it? Like, what, what role does ritual play when, when you, you know, consciously want the intention to connect with a particular plant or flower? Mm -hmm. I think of the ritual as the pause, because when we pause and when we empty, that's when something sacred can come forward. And so that's the ritual. Mm -hmm. in, in my work, it's, okay, you have this flower essence. The standard dose is four drops under the tongue four times a day. Mm -hmm. 
And so you can just get up and drop it under your tongue or put it in your water and go on about your life. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And you'll still have some impact from that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the process of saying, I'm going to be silent. I'm going to be still. I'm going to pause here and listen. And that's the ritual. That's the invitation to the divine. That's the invitation to our ancestors. That's Mm -hmm. the invitation to the natural world to to come speak, come be with me, come answer the questions that I can't answer just from a logical space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you, you said it, the pause, like there's, that's so powerful, just the pause and, and having awareness and what you're about to do and why you're doing it. And, um, I think that's important in a lot of areas of our life, not just (laughs) working with flower essences. It's true. And that idea, I mean, coming full circle that um, living is a religious act. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a heated argument with someone and you pause and you just just pause for a minute to say, what is happening here? Mm -hmm. What are the subconscious shenanigans? What should I be doing? What should I not be doing? That's the invitation for a new way of being to come in. And Mm -hmm. so it's not separate. It's a lifestyle and it's a ongoing practice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like too, the pause um, allows you to bring in some of your own, um, your own ability to sort of assess what is going on within you. Like, is it really about this person making me mad or is this about um, grief that I had five years ago? Like it, exactly. it brings in that space. That um, awareness. Mm-hmm. The the Taoist, my teacher taught me that the Taoist would call it reversing the handle of the stars. Mm. This idea of bringing that light from outward to inward mm. to see what's there mm-hmm. and to be present to what's there. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Um, so now that we have, you know, these tools for this awareness and this presence and this pause, um, I wonder if we can go through maybe some specific um, examples or some some specific reasons why um, you would recommend somebody to work with flower essences mm-hmm. going through, you know, the different um, parts of ourselves, like beginning with the physical body, mm-hmm. like, um, you know, I know I'm sure there are, you know, innumerable reasons to use flower essences, but if you could give us an example of how it could affect a a person who is a physical um, situation happening. Sure. And I would love to start, I I tend to think of the the body and the human experience in these four layers, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. Okay. And so I'll start with the spiritual, actually. Great. Okay. (laughs) So the first place that we think of flower essence use is is for that feeling of, I just don't feel aligned. Mm. I feel confused. I'm not sure if I'm doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm in the right relationship. I'm not sure if I'm in the right career path. That, That sense of not feeling totally like we're living on purpose Mm. and all of the different ways that might show up that might feel like anxiety. It might feel like depression. It might feel like confusion, but at the heart of it, it's the sense of disconnection and, and feeling lost. And so there are flower essences to support us in creating that pause, Mm. uh, creating the practices that may be unique to us to reconnect to our source, um, there are also flower essences that support us in listening to our own intuition and our own inner knowing. So that first layer of, you know, that confusion, that mm-hmm. feeling of disconnect, that spiritual malalignment from whatever source is the first place that I would look at flower essences. Then if we come down to a mental level, it's those thoughts. It's those Mm -hmm. limiting beliefs. It's those things that we are kind of living out, but we don't even know that we think them. These are the shenanigans you were talking about. Those are those shenanigans. (laughs) (laughs) So those shenanigans might be things like underlying feelings of guilt or underlying feelings of um, lack of Mm self-worth or even something I, I tend to do a lot of this work with folks that are trying to step into entrepreneurship or business. And there might even be a belief that, oh, you have to work hard for money. Sure, maybe. 
Or maybe there's another way to attract things to you. Mm -hmm. So there's so many thoughts that come from our families of origins, that come from our from our upbringing that may or may not be true, but we never even question them. Mm -hmm. And so the flower essence support us in seeing what's in there that's out of harmony with the rest of the symphony and challenging and saying, okay, is this true or not true? Mm -hmm. Do I want to move forward with this belief or is this belief actually blocking me from my own greatness and authentic self? And so that's where the flower essences support us on a mental level. It's, it's kind of getting in there, mm -hmm. seeing what's there, or if necessary, turning off the constant dialogue of thoughts mm -hmm. so that we can have that pause and that spaciousness. Um, so that's area number two. Okay. <laughs> area number three is on the emotional level. And so when we think about flower essences for emotional healing, it's with the understanding that all emotions have value. There is no hierarchy of it's better to feel joy than it is to feel anger mm -hmm. in this system. It's more in the sense of what's the appropriate emotion for the situation at hand. Mm -hmm. So if you're at a funeral, it may not be appropriate to be full of joy and laughter. And if you're at a party, it's not appropriate to be full of grief and crying in the corner. <laughs> so we want to learn what is it that this emotion is teaching us mm -hmm. what is it bringing forward for us can we process that emotion can we move through that emotion and if we can't that's where the flower essences are supportive mm -hmm. and sometimes it helps to bring clarity around the, the feelings we didn't know we were feeling mm. so there are some emotions just socially that we're we're socialized not to acknowledge anger is one of them fear is one of them so what do we do we stuff them down and they become the subconscious shenanigans. Mm -hmm. They start running amok. And so sometimes even the flower essence will bring up the, the hidden emotion that we didn't know was there so that we can move forward with more authenticity. Mm. Beautiful. And then that brings us to the physical. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so our, because flower essences are so subtle and they work on these subtle invisible planes of spirit and mind and emotion, I tend not to go to flower essences to treat a physical ailment. Mm. Uh, I like to say, if you break your arm, don't come to me for flower essences. Go get your arm fixed. <laughs> But what we can do is we can work with the flower essences to better understand your relationship with your physical body, mm. your relationship with your physicality, whether that's your sexuality, whether that is your diet, whether that's how much sleep you allow yourself to get and why. Mm -hmm. All of those things that are physical actions for our physical health, the flower essences can support us in having deeper awareness into how we can treat our bodies a little bit better mm. um, in accordance with what we have going on in our lives. I love that. So, I mean, it's going to affect your physical body no matter. <laughs> right, because they're not separate things. Right. And that goes back to indigenous philosophy that mind, body, spirit, emotions, it's not, they're not separate buckets. Mm -hmm. What you do to one is going to affect all of them. Right. Just like when I go running in the mornings, that makes me feel happier, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not that you're just working on your physical body or you're just working on your spiritual body. It's one continuum. Yeah. So what you do at one end of the pole is going to trickle on down and affect the other side. It's going to affect the whole symphony. It's going to affect the whole symphony. Mm -hmm. So do you only use flower essences when you're having a problem or there's some type of disease or discomfort or can they be used for, um, you know, times of wellness, whatever wellness means. <laughs> we could talk a whole hour about that, yes. but um, can you use them at any time or um, is, that, is there usually has to be a need for them? I would say you can use flower essences whenever you are trying to create something, whenever you're trying to manifest something, mm. or whenever you're trying to heal something. So sure, there may be a symptom that's speaking loudly that you are coming to the flower essences for support around. But sometimes, you know, you might just have a really big vision for your life. Mm. And then it's like, well, how do I step into that? How mm -hmm. do I build my confidence? Or how do I listen to my intuition more clearly or you know I notice sometimes I 
go to step on a stage and I feel embarrassed or shy. So in order for me to step fully into that, there's a flower essence for that. So it's not just for when we're hurting, mm -hmm. but you know, we are creative beings mm. and also we're all here up to something. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the belief. We all have a purpose or something to contribute to this larger web of the universe or some would say the Tao. And so the flower essences, I, I feel like are really great allies for us to clarify and to step into our, our smaller part in the bigger whole. Mm, I love that. So they're always welcome they're and always, always helping. <laughs> um, That's right. I love that. So, um, you know, you mentioned healing. Like, what does it mean to have um, conscious participation in your own healing journey or even just in your own life journey? Mm -hmm. What comes to mind for me with that is, is intention. And so one thing I will say about the healing journey, whether it's with flower essences or any other kind of energetic spiritual healing, is that it's not linear. We don't go from bad to better and better and better to great. We go from not feeling great to feeling better to feeling a little worse to feeling a little better and better and oops, I feel worse again. And so when we're bringing consciousness to that process, at least for myself, things feel a little bit less chaotic. Mm. So that even when I'm having one of those moments where it feels like I'm moving retrograde or things aren't moving or feeling as great as I want them to, I can understand that it's part of a cycle and a rhythm. And it's bringing that, that consciousness to that journey. It's bringing a sense of awareness to how I'm showing up for my family, uh, for my community. And it, it brings us into more authentic connection mm. with one another and with the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps us to move out of the indoctrination of ourselves as, as individuals. We're not. We're all connected. And so the, the consciousness that moves us towards greater connection and harmony is, is what we're looking at. Mm. Even if it's uncomfortable, mm -hmm. which it often is. Yeah. That's... Very important work. It's big work. It feels it's like big work. you do it your whole life, <laughs> you know, and it's not linear. I love that you said it's not linear, that it's a cycle because, um, you know, as we, we do this and we, we live our lives, um, I'm wondering if you can speak a bit about um, nature's law of cause and effect and how mm -hmm. that relates to what we're talking about in our journey and our healing. Yes. So when I think about uh, cause and effect, it puts us on a linear timeline right? This happened and then this happened, or A plus B leads to C leads to D. And my experience with nature is that it follows a different system of time mm. in that it's, it's cyclical time. And rather than chronological time, it's this, my favorite word, Kairos. So Kairos, um, Chronological comes from Kronos, which was one of the, the Greek gods. And then Kairos was the other, was another deity. And Kairos relates to the opportune time for something to happen. Mm. So that matters because when we're thinking about holistic wellness, it's not, as we said, it's not linear. It's, it's more cyclical, it's more spiral, and it's more associative. So when we're looking at holistic healing, we're looking at patterns as opposed to cause and effect. And I think this is really important because a lot of times I'll hear things, uh, I'll hear someone say, oh, I got sick because I wasn't thinking high vibration thoughts. And then internalizing that is a blame and shame. Mm -hmm. And then there's this false belief that, well, if I just think good things, only good things will happen. Mm -hmm. Logical, but not true right. <laughs> in this system. <laughs> right. And so when we look at indigenous philosophy, we see systems, we see circles, we see patterns, we see signatures, which is what I, which I talk a lot about in my work. We see archetypal patterns so that the person that comes in and they have shoulder and neck tension and they're facing microaggressions at work 
and they're feeling frustrated and they have some creative projects that they can't quite get off the ground. All of those are now signatures that point to a particular archetypal pattern, mm -hmm. which in five element theory we would say is the wood element. Right, so we can't necessarily say, oh, well, the back pain is causing the microaggressions, is causing the frustration. Mm -hmm. They're just all existing and emerging together mm -hmm. in a shared field. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we see in these archetypal patterns of nature, that there's resonance mm -hmm. and association more so than a linear cause and effect. Mm. It's very helpful and makes so much sense. You know, it's it's not complicated. It, it seems so um, natural. It seems like, but of course, this is all connected, and this is this is how it's affecting us. Mm -hmm. It's all connected. Yes, that's what it always comes back to. <laughs> it's all connected. So I think you you know you've done a really great job of establishing that this medicine is for everyone and anyone. You know, um, and so um, you know what. What happens to people as they, um, you know, sort of go down this path and they, they, they have the intention of working with flower essences um, to, to heal or to grow or, or for, you know, what, what could happen to, in someone's life? It's one of those medicines where it feels so authentically ourselves. And I say that to say there are some times where you can take a medicine or even drink wine or something and you might hear yourself doing or saying something differently. And you're like, oh, that's not me. That's the wine or whatever. And then with flower essences, because it's about resonance, because it's awakening and harmonizing things that are already inside of you, it feels so authentic that sometimes you don't even know how much you've changed or how much your life has changed until someone else points it out to you. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I do in my practice is I, I've gotten into the habit of writing it down. So I'll say, okay, I'm going to start using this flower essence. And these are the things that are happening in my life that I'm coming to this flower essence for support around. And over time, sometimes it's two weeks, sometimes it's three weeks, sometimes it's four months, whatever that cycle is things just start to move and shift. And all of a sudden, I'm not feeling the same way I felt before. And I'm not thinking about the same things that I was thinking about before. The things that were keeping me up at night are just not a big deal. But it happens so gradually and so subtly that it's not until I go back and look at my journal that I even realize, oh, I'm different. Mm -hmm. It's that process. And that's where working with a practitioner can help in terms of mirroring and reflecting back. Okay, you said that you wanted to move and now it's not even a month later and you're packing your bags. And look at how different your life is. But it wasn't necessarily like a, sometimes can feel like a lightning bolt of an aha moment. Mm -hmm. But it's very gradual and it feels very authentic and and often in this work, it just creates ease and opens the way. Mm. And so it's the reflecting back that allows us to see, oh, things are different mm -hmm. than they were. Mm -hmm. So what happens is a lot of times students will come into the class because they're in their own healing process and they want to start using the flower essences. Mm -hmm. And then as they're using the flower essences, their friends and family will come to them and say, oh, you know, you're different and you're changing. And so they'll say, well, why don't you try this flower essence? And then all of a sudden they're wanting to become practitioners because they can see how powerful the shifts are in their mm -hmm. lives and in the lives of the people that they love. Mm, that's beautiful. I love that. Um, I, I'm wondering if you could speak for a moment too. You know, we've explored a bit about, you know, how you can explore flower essences personally and your own journey, but can you kind of talk about the difference between working with a practitioner mm -hmm. and doing sort of your own research or, or <laughs> experimentation? <laughs> I would say yes and. <laughs> Do your research and experimentation. And that's one of the things about the flower essences that they are very forgiving. Um, and there are organizations, including the Bach Organization and the Flower Essence Society, they've published really tremendous work that people can 
jump right in there, see the flower essence they need, use it, experiment with it. The book that I have out, I hope also speaks to that, like self-care with flower essences. And so the, the process of working with a practitioner, how it changes is that it's a different level of accountability to your own transformational process. Mm. Because again, the shifts are so subtle that you might not notice how you're changing. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect of it. But also it's having someone hold and be in relationship with you as you transform. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, really key is that we don't heal as individuals. We heal in relationship. That's actually an alchemical principle of transformation. Things change in relationship. And so working with a practitioner establishes that relationship and holds that space for your change and transformation to happen over time mm. and to help you chart the course. Mm -hmm. I always tell my clients, I say, you know, I am a, I don't use the word expert, but I know a whole lot about flower essences. I've been using them for a very long time. But you are an expert in your life, mm -hmm. and we are in partnership. And mm. so you are steering the ship, and I'm going to be there with you through the storms. Mm. That's the that's the image that I use for the process of working with a flower essence practitioner. It sounds supportive. It sounds it sounds really amazing and um, like really important work um, for those who who feel called to to do it. Absolutely. And, and also sometimes it just streamlines mm -hmm. because there are so many flower essences. You could really spend 10 years just looking for the right essence right. and hopefully a competent practitioner will say, well, there's these two right here. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Save yourself a couple of hours yes. of digging online. And... It can be quite efficient too. Right. <laughs> So, um, Lindsay, tell us, tell us how um, our viewers and our listeners can find out more about your work and what you do in the world. Uh, thank you so much for asking. So one of the main places that folks can find me is at the Spirit Seed, which is the school where I teach flower essence therapy, but also indigenous and diasporic worldviews. So uh, that's a space for anyone who is beginning this healing journey on their own, or even if you're an established practitioner and you want to start integrating this stuff in. Mm -hmm. The Spirit Seed is our, our cyber hub. Mm -hmm. for all of that and there's a very vibrant community there um, and I can be found on social media um, just by my name um, Lindsay Font Leroy is long so Lindsay Font is the way to find me and um, yeah I'd love to connect with folks that are curious and interested and and wanting to know more about this this medicine it's so powerful mm, thank you and your book as well and my book as well <laughs> yes <laughs> So my book is now out in all the places you love to buy books. Mm -hmm. And um, at this point, there is a, uh, an audio book that, will, that is also available. Amazing. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, this conversation has been so rich and so um, informative. And also, I think even just talking about these things is so healing. Yes. Because um, it helps us realize our connectedness to one another, to nature, how we have all these support systems that, that are just built into the world that maybe we forgot about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my students said the other day, uh, her name was Ivy, and she said, we walk past medicine every day mm. and we don't even know it's there. Yes. And that just really resonated for me. Yeah, really, really potent. Um, I'm wondering if you will close us out with um, a message or a final statement or something to, um, to, to send our viewers or listeners off with. So at the Spirit Seed, we have a commitment that is uh, somewhat of a prayer, somewhat of a reminder that is the guiding principle of our work. And so I'd love to share that. Yes, please. So, I pledge allegiance to the earth for soul awakening and remembering as part of humanity in which we stand, one heart, spirit embodied, interconnected with liberation and justice for all. And so it is. And so it is. Lindsay, thank you so much. We're so glad to have you here. I loved speaking with you today. Thank you. And thank you for creating and holding this space for these conversations. And to all our viewers and listeners, thank you for joining us at Open Heart Conversations. We'll see you next time.